करते हैं Hello. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> um hi guys. Um so I just wanted to make a quick announcement about a new social media app which is basically an app that helps you connect to people who like to do similar activities to you at similar times. So like let's say you want to go to a Thai restaurant but your friends are not available. So what this app does is is it basically finds 3 to 5 other people that can go with you. from your like facebook friends and like your friends connections as well so yeah if you're interested um professor damodran will send out a link afterwards thanks so can can you send a message out about quiz 1 and preparing and five people can gather together or just uh, is it I guess not. Uh. Okay, so a reminder again quiz 1 is day after tomorrow. Don't look so gloomy, eh? Your good news is the quiz is done. You're a week away from spring break, right? That's a good news, so it is what it is, eh? So first 30 minutes of class, come prepared, don't come late. And if you're not going to come at all, let me know before the quiz starts, okay? So let's pick up where we left off because we were talking about getting a bottom up beta for Disney and I'd broken Disney down into five businesses. A little bit of warning. Today's class we're going to build on things so it will require you to kind of hang in there because you will feel this urge about 20 minutes into the class to kind of say okay this is too much I you know hang in there. It's not difficult it's just a bunch of steps built on top of each other. So I talked about estimating the beta for the movie business, okay? So somebody help me retrace my steps to get a beta for Disney's movie business. You're looking down now, you're afraid to ask me to retrace. It. Okay. So I guess that means no, you don't want to. Anybody want to help me retrace my steps of to how I got the beta for the movie business? Go ahead. Okay so first step is I've got to I have to go find other publicly traded movie companies okay that's the first step then because they're publicly traded I get their levered betas then and tell me why I want to do that because Disney might choose to have a different debt to equity ratio than those companies so I unlever the beta then I clean up for cash it's a little tricky you're saying what the heck does that mean Now, take a look at that very long email I sent to you yesterday. Towards the very last step, I kind of go through the process of what it means to clean up for cash. Because cash has a beta of zero, I come up with an unlevered beta for being in the movie business. That's my end game. It's called a pure play beta, and the unlevered beta for being in the movie business is right there. 1.0993. So I've got one of the five businesses down and I want to do this for the other four. You know why I picked the movie business to do this on because it was the easiest of the five to do it on. So I'm going to run into all kinds of crap on my way to the other five and along the way I'll take you for a journey of what I had to do. Question on. How many companies did you take while I Okay. Let's that's actually a very good question. Is two companies enough, four enough, five? Let's start with a very simple proposition. What's the law of large numbers? savings and standard error does somebody remember the statistical equation on how much savings you get as a function of sample size if i want one regression beta let's say i have a standard error of 0.20 that's awful right if i have 9 and you'll see the reason why i picked 9 it's making your life easier even though you don't might not realize it now if i have 9 companies in my sample how much more precise is my estimate going to be than if i have just one There's a clue here as to why I gave you nine. It's the square root of the sample size. So when you have nine companies in your sample, your standard error is going to be one third of what an individual regression beta st 
standard error. So already by going from 1 to 9, you've improved from you've you eliminated almost two-thirds of your standard error. If you go to 25, obviously you get rid of 80 percent. If you go to 100, you're going to get rid of 90 percent. But notice as I go from 4 to 9 how much I'm saving. So if you can get 9, be happy. If you can get 25, be delirious. If you can get 100, start dancing. It's just the numbers. Yeah. That's exactly the, one of the great rules. And the question was, doesn't that make the comparables less comparable? Right? Because if I go to 100, I'm going to get companies not like mine. One of the great things about the law of large numbers is what? As the sample size gets bigger, I can afford to get more and more sloppy about what I call comparable, because whatever's not comparable across the companies is going to start averaging out. So some may be doing TV shows on the side. And so, so as long as those differences are not in the same direction, the larger my sample size gets, the more sloppy I can get about similar companies. So if you have a small group of non-comparable companies, then you worry. If you have a large group of non-comparable companies, less to worry about. So the bigger your sample, the more you can get away with getting companies that are not quite like yours. So everybody with me so far? So I've got a beta for the movie business, 1.0993. Let me move on to the media networks business, which is a fancy word for the broadcasting business. Now, if you're in the U.S. and you think about big broadcasting companies, there are four big broadcasting companies that come to most people's minds. Somebody name them for me. ABC, Roy, CBS, NBC, and Fox. And already you can see the problem I'm going to run into. In 2013, ABC was owned by Disney. NBC used to be owned by GE. You couldn't find it in GE. It was so small. Then it got owned by Comcast. You couldn't find it in Comcast. It was too small. CBS used to be part of Westinghouse. It then became an independent company, but it wasn't around for enough time for me to get a beta. And Fox, of course, is part of News Corp. And nobody can find anything in that company. It's a, like a you know, shell game. So if I define comparables as those big broadcasting companies, I have a sample of one. That's not going to help me. Desperation time. Here's my first ploy when I hit desperation time. I go up and down the food chain. What am I talking about? I look for companies that feed into the broadcasting business and feed out. I'll give you a couple of examples of companies I brought into my sample. Have you heard of a company called King World? It syndicates TV shows. It used to syndicate the Oprah show and Jeopardy and sell them to the broadcasting stations. So all they do is they buy shows, they syndicate them, they sell them. They make their money off the broadcasting business. When broadcasting does well, they do well. When broadcasting does badly, they do badly. I included that as one of the comparable companies. I included Nielsen. How does Nielsen make money? It measures ratings, and the ratings get paid for by the broadcasting companies because they want advertisers to know how many people are watching their shows. Nielsen makes it. Do you see where, I, where I'm going? I'm saying, look, if I cannot find a broadcasting company, I'm going to look for companies that make money off the broadcasting business because my definition of comparable are companies that do well when I do well and do badly when I do badly. Hey, desperation ploy worked off. I ended up with the sample size of 26. I do exactly what I did with the movie business. I get an average beta, debt to equity ratio, unlevered clean up for cash. Unlevered beta for being in the broadcasting business is 1.03. So I've got two betas down. Then I'll move to the theme park business. Yes? I'm sorry? We'll go to that. If desperation lets you stay in the U.S., why go looking for trouble, right? So the first desperation ploy, I found enough in the U.S. I didn't have to go looking outside, so I stopped that. Theme park business, I did the same thing. I looked for theme parks in the U.S. and I found two. One is Six Flags, which is a basket case. You don't want to include that in any sample. And the other is a company called Cedar something. Those of you from the Midwest probably know it's, it's Cedar Plain, Cedar something. It's, it has these theme parks in the Midwest. Two companies. Again in trouble, right? Here... Again, desperation time. Here I went global. Not postal, but global. What does that mean? I said, why am I staying focused on the U.S.? What's the average rate across all U.S. companies? Don't take too long. 
One. What's the average beta across all European companies? One. What's the average beta across all India? Do you see where I'm going? Beta is scaled around one no matter where in the world I go. So I see no reason to stay focused on the US. So here I said, let me go global. I look for theme parks across the globe. Here again, desperation flow I worked up. I ended up with a sample of 20. Many are European companies. For instance, there's a Lego theme park in Europe that is publicly traded. So I included that in my sample. Again, sample size kicks in. I take the average beta, clean it up, come up with an unlevered beta for being in the theme park business. And you're saying, that looks low. It is actually low. Theme park businesses by themselves are not that risky. What makes them risky is if you borrow a ton of money like Six Flags does to build its theme parks. Then I looked at consumer products and here I didn't try too hard. Why? Because it's a very small part of Disney and Disney just uses it as a dumping ground for its licensing, its toys, its software. So I look for publicly traded companies in that space. I found about 44, which is good enough for me. The unlevered beta of being in that space is 0.6752. And finally, I looked at the newest business, the interactive gaming business. And there I looked at publicly traded gaming companies. And the unlevered beta for those companies is 1.22. I have five businesses and I have a beta for each business. Some I feel more confident about than others, but I have a number for each of the five businesses. Any questions? Yes. The company unlevered beta includes cash. So basically it gives me a beta for being a movie company. But if 10% of the company is cash and 90% is movies, I want an unlevered beta for the movie business. That's, that's the cash adjustment. So if you have a company that's half cash and half movies, I want to take out the effect of cash because it's bringing my beta down. That's why the unlevered beta for the business is always higher than the unlevered beta for cash. Okay. Any questions? Yes. No, but remember, it doesn't matter. What's the savings of the, even if every one of these betas is as imprecise as your regression beta, what's going to happen in average up? It's the averaging that does not for me. It's not that the regression betas are any better. They're all crappy. But this is one of the great things about the law of large numbers. You take a hundred crappy numbers, you put them in a pot, you stir them up, you pull the average out. The average is magically precise. I never got this in my statistics class, but I think I get it now. What does it mean when you say there's a big standard error in my beta? Some of your betas are overestimated, some are underestimated. When I average out, I average out my mistakes. That's as simple as that. So no matter what kind of regression beta you have, I can always, always beat it with a bottom-up beta. So the advantage you gain here is you get the law of large numbers working in your favor. And here's another advantage. When did Disney enter the interactive gaming business? Probably two years ago. You see where I'm going next? If I run a regression beta, it cannot reflect the new businesses I'm getting into, but because I get to pick what businesses you're in, not only can I reflect the businesses you're in today, I can even be proactive. So if you tell me I plan to be in a new business next week, I can bring that into your beta. I regain control of this process when I use a bottom-up beta. And all of this needs betas for individual companies. 20 years ago, that would have been a lot of work. 30 years ago, it was close to impossible. That's why I asked you to kind of get acquainted with Capital IQ, because you go to Capital IQ, pick any sector, you can pull up the betas for every company in the sector, do this yourself for any group of companies anywhere in the world. So I've got the unlevered beta for each of the five businesses. What's the next step? What do I need to do next? I need to lever the betas, right? To get the, oh, before I do the unlevered beta, let's come up with the values for the five businesses. Maybe that's a good intermediate stop. So Disney's in five businesses. The beta for Disney as a company is a weighted average of the betas of these five unlevered betas weighted by the values of each of the five businesses. So here's what I did. I took the five businesses they were in. Right? I'm sorry. I took the five businesses they were in. So there are the five businesses. I took the revenues that Disney reported for those five businesses in the most recent year. So this comes right out of the Disney financial statements. If I'm feeling lazy, I can just take the weights based on revenues. But if I do that, you know what I'm assuming? I'm assuming a dollar in revenue in the theme park business is worth exactly the same amount as a dollar in revenue in the consumer product business, and they're not. Why not? Because they have different margins, different growth rates. So I'd like to convert revenues into value. 
So here I'm going to go back to the studio business to show you how I came up with that parameter. Okay? Remember I showed you this table for the studio business? And in the table I have market cap and total debt and cash. Three, three numbers I can pull for any company which is publicly traded. If I take market cap plus debt minus cash, debt plus equity minus cash, I come up with what's called enterprise value. If, ever, if you ever work with bankers, they love this number, EV, EV to this, EV to that. Enterprise value is really the market value of the operating assets of a company. So basically, I've got the market value of the operating assets for each of the companies. I divide that enterprise value by the revenues of each company. You see what I'm trying to figure out? How is the market pricing these companies? What multiple of revenues are, the mar is the, are investors paying for movie companies? And across movie companies, that median number was 3.05. What does that mean? Every dollar in revenue in a movie business translates to about $3.05 in market value. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the revenues that Disney reports by business. See the 3.05 that came right off the table, and I do that for the other four businesses as well because I have there the, the numbers. So a dollar in value in the broadcasting business is worth 327, but a dollar in value in the consumer product business is worth only 83 cents. Why is it worth so much less? Because margins are smaller, and it's not as valuable to make money in the consumer product business. I come up with the estimated values of the five businesses. I add up those numbers. The total value that I get for Disney's operating businesses is $135 billion. That is my estimated value for the five businesses. That's what I use to come up with the weights of each of the businesses. So if I divide 66,580 by 135, I come up with 49%. Based on my estimates, here's what Disney looks like to me. It's about 49.27% broadcasting. And much of that 49.2% is what part of the broadcasting business? It's ESPN. You take ESPN out, big chunk of that 40, and that's why people are freaking out about ESPN kind of shrinking. It is the biggest single piece of Disney by far. 33.81% is theme parks and resorts. 13.5% is movies. 2% is consumer products. 1.25% is gaming. Make sure your weights all add up to 100%. That's the only requirement you have here. So those are my weights. My weighted average, so basically I take the unlevered beta and I multiply by the weight. The weighted average unlevered beta for Disney's operating businesses is 0 0.9239. I'm getting closer to my end game. I've almost got a beta for Disney's equity, but I now have at least a beta for Disney's five businesses. Now Disney does have some cash. In fact, in 2013, that 3.93 billion in cash that I haven't counted yet. If you ask me for Disney as a company, and again I'm drawing the distinction between Disney's businesses and the company, the beta of a Disney as a company will be 0.9239 that I got from here. The 135.13 is the value of their operating assets based on my estimates. So I'm going to take a weighted average of the 0.9239 and zero because that's a beta of cash. The beta for Disney as a company will be 0.8978. Think again in terms of a balance sheet. We've got Disney's operations, Disney's cash, debt equity. I now have a beta for both Disney's operating businesses and Disney as a company. And the last thing I need to do now is to bring in the debt to equity ratio. Once I do that, I'm home free. I'm going to get a beta for Disney's equity without ever looking at a single regression beta for Disney as a company. Any questions? So I need a debt to equity ratio, but here's the problem. What's the debt to equity ratio we said we should use to come up with the levered beta? Market debt to equity or a book debt to equity? You got a 50-50 shot. Two days before the quiz. It shouldn't be a 50-50. It should be 60-40, maybe 70-30, maybe 100-0. Market or book? It should always be market value. Why? Because betas are market concepts. It's how you raise money. You need market debt, market equity. And now I'm going to have a problem. You know why? I have a market debt and equity for Disney as a company, it's publicly traded, but I don't have a market debt and a market equity for each of the five businesses. How come? They're not traded, right? Disney theme parks doesn't get tra traded separately, ESPN doesn't get traded separately. So what I had was a market debt to equity ratio for the company. And to show you how I've evolved in terms of my laziness, in 98 when I wrote the first edition of this book, you know what I did? I threw up my hands. 
I said, I don't have a debt to equity for the five businesses. At that time, there were four businesses. I'm going to use Disney's debt to equity as the debt to equity for all of the businesses. And I was never happy with that solution because I know these are five very different businesses. Making TV shows, making movies, building theme parks, all don't take the same amount of debt. So here's what I did to come up with the debt to equity ratio for the five businesses. Disney broke down their assets into what they called identifiable assets, just physical assets by business. So there's the breakdown. I assume that the debt that Disney has as a company is allocated based on those assets, it's proportional to those assets. So for instance here, they reported a lot of assets for the broadcasting business. I attach more debt to the broadcasting business, saying that's where your assets are, that's where the debt is going to be. How do I know? I don't. You could have picked something else as your proxy, but that gives me the dollar debt by business. So there's the allocated debt. There's my estimated value of equity for the business. I come up, because I have the value of the business already from the previous page, so the 66,580 is what I estimate as the value of the business. You subtract out the debt, you get a value of the equity. So basically, I use the allocated debt to come up with the value of equity in each business. So I've got debt and equity of each business. In the last column, you see my debt to equity ratio. And look at how different they are. It's 10% for media networks, 11.4% for theme parks, 20.7% for movies, 117% for their consumer products. That first shocked me, but then I looked at how they run their consumer product business, and actually they don't make any toys. They don't make any software anymore. It's all licensed stuff. So it's almost just license fees. They can afford to borrow a significant amount. So I left it at 117%. And finally, the gaming business has, has a debt to equity of 41%. The debt to equity ratio for Disney as a company, I know already. That I could actually calculate. That was 13.1%. I'm almost home. I have the unlevered beta for the five businesses. The unlevered beta for Disney as a company. I have the debt to equity ratio from right there for each company. I come up with the levered beta for each business. There it is and a cost of equity for each business. Let me repeat the steps. First step in the process, I broke Disney down into five businesses. Actually, I let them break themselves down into five businesses. Second step, I got the unlevered beta for each of the five businesses using that process of finding com public companies in each space. Third step, I took a weighted average of those unlevered betas using my estimated values for each business. Fourth step, I took the debt I allocated across the businesses, came up with a debt to equity ratio for each business, Fifth step, I come up with a levered beta for each business. Yes? It is. So the debt does include leases. R&D, I don't know. What R&D does Disney do that has multiple? So there is no R&D for Disney. In the tech, if this were a pharmaceutical company, it might. I did it just for leases. The debt you see for Disney already incorporates leases. But there's... A, no. Yeah, I don't think it will make much of a difference unless you have a huge operating lease company, in which case it will make a difference, but then do it for all the companies. You can't just do it for your company. Remember the comparable companies? You'd have to do it for all of them. So do it either for all of them or for none of them, right? You can't take an intermediate step. I have a cost of equity now for Disney as a company and each of its five businesses. Yes? That is proportion of, that's actually the proportion of the total value. So that, those are my estimated values for each business. The debt I'm allocating based on where you tell me of your physical assets. I'm assuming that you borrow money for land and building and equipment, but not for generic brand name. So that's the reason you have different allocation mechanisms. But if you, ha if you got stuck, you could actually use the same mechanism that I did on the previous page to allocate debt as well. Now, sometimes that's all you might be able to do. I have a cost of equity for Disney as a company for each of its five businesses. Let me tell you, tell you now, this has been a long ride to get to this page, but I'll tell you why I need this page. Okay? Let's assume that you're the movie guy at Disney. You know the movie guy does, right? He hangs out in Hollywood, goes to parties, so you got the fun job. I'm the CFO of Disney. What do I do? I tell you no. That's my job. I'm the number cruncher in a creative company. You know how popular I am. So I hang out in my office. I have guards in outside my doors because I'm afraid one of the creative guys will come in and beat me up. 
So you're the big creative guy. You knock, you come into my office like any movie guy comes. You don't knock, you just bust into my office like my daughter does. And you tell me you have a new movie you'd like to fund. You ready with your job? So here's the new movie. Let's give it a name. Let's call it Lone Ranger 2. This time with our Johnny Depp. You kind of learned your lesson. Ready? So I get ready to shut the door in your face. Because I remember the last time you made a Lone Ranger movie, how, it, I had to write up about 170 million. I said, get out of here. He said, this time we've looked at the numbers, you tell me. Which tells me something about last time, but let's not go there. And this time, I think we can make a 9.5% return in equity. No movie guy talks like this, but act like you do. I had five MBAs, they've crunched through the numbers, they've come up. See why I picked 9.5% as your return in equity? Go back to the previous page. 9.5% is higher than the cost of equity for Disney as a company. Right? So the rule is you should take projects that make more than your cost of equity. If you follow that rule, you're beating the cost of equity, but it's lower than the cost of equity for the, the movie business, which is 9.92%. Do you see the question I'm posing to you? When you look at a project as part of a big company, should you be comparing the return in equity on that project to the cost of equity of the company taking the project or the cost of equity that reflects the risk of the business that that project is in? Think about it for a second because this to me is one of the first principles in corporate finance. It gets violated right and left in regular companies. I want you to think about intuitively what makes more sense to compare to the cost of equity, the company that takes the project or the business that the project is in. How many would pick the company's cost of equity? Really? How many would pick the cost of equity that reflects the risk of the business this company is in? You should be the CFOs <laughs> of the companies. And you can see why. Give me the intuitive. Let me play devil's advocate. The company is coming up with the money to take the project. Why should I not use the company's cost of equity? Why should I use the cost of equity that reflects the risk of the project? Yes. Okay, so tell me what will happen if I do use the company's cost of equity to take a project and take those movie projects. In other words, I'll be subsidizing my movie business by doing what? By letting my safe businesses fund my movie. You're saying, what's wrong with that? For a subsidy to last, you need subsidizers. So year after year, if your risky projects get subsidized by your safe businesses, your safe businesses are going to get smaller and smaller, and one day there are going to be no safe businesses left to subsidize your risky businesses. You're going to look back and say, what the hell did we do? It's Corporate Finance 101. When you look for a hurdle rate, you have to come up with a hurdle rate that reflects the risk of what you're doing, not the risk of the entity looking at the project. You can be the safest business or company in the face of the earth, but if you're going into a risky business, you should be demanding a much higher cost of equity for going in there because the risk is there. It's not going to go away just because you're looking at the business. Half of all U.S. companies, and these are large U.S. companies, use one hurdle rate across the company. In other words, they violate this principle on a daily basis. And there are two reasons for it. One is, how do most companies get betas? When I asked the banker, where do betas come from, what did he say? It came from Bloomberg, right? How many betas can you look up for, can you look up, so when I ask you for a beta for Disney, what do you do? You run to the Bloomberg terminal, you type in Disney theme parks, and what do you get? No Disney theme parks, is it Disney movies? No Disney movies. The only beta that you can get is a beta for Disney as a company. So the only way you get betas is from a regression. You are trapped. You can get only one beta for the whole company. You can't get betas for the pieces. That's the first reason. Here's the second one. Every time you bring this up, that different parts of a company should have different costs of equity, different hurdle rates, you get a political blowback from the businesses that feel that they'll now be at a disadvantage. I'll tell you a story. 
But 20 years ago, one of my students went to work for the Gap. This was when the Gap was on, just on the verge of expanding. In fact, at the time that he went to the Gap, every store that the Gap opened was another Gap mall store. That was a typical project. Every project looked exactly like the previous one. And the Gap had a hurdle rate of 18%. Don't even ask me where that came from, but that was a hurdle rate, 18%. They might have made it up, for all I know. But every project was exactly like the previous project. When he went in, they were on the verge of opening two new divisions. One was Banana Republic, and the other was Old Navy. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic concept, but this guy called me from his office, and he's very excited about these two, and he described the businesses to me. And if you know enough about these three businesses, you can probably tell me something about what kind of hurdle rate they should have. Remember, we went through this process. Okay? So you've got Banana Republic, Gap, and, and Old Navy. If you were thinking in terms of discretionary, non-discretionary, which of these companies should have the highest betas and which one should have the lowest betas? Justin? Why? Okay, Banana Republic is just gap clothes marked up by 35%, <laughs> but you don't have to deal with the riffraff. Right? Well, if you have people around, you feel more special. Okay? Which is nice, but it's going to come up with a higher hurdle rate. Old Navy is gap clothes knocked down 30%, but you deal with a lot of riffraff. So we went through this process and we kind of agreed that you should probably have a 20% hurdle rate for Banana Republic and 18 for Gap and 16 for Old Navy. He said, that sounds good. I'll bring it up at the divisional head meeting next week. I knew exactly what he was walking into, but I didn't want to tell him. I said, call me after the meeting. Tell me how it goes. So he calls me after the meeting. He says, it did not go well. So what do you mean? He said, I brought up this idea of having different hurdle rates for the three divisions, and one of the divisional heads did not like the idea at all. I said, let me guess. Who was it? Who do you think it was? The Banana Republic guy. And I said, what did the CEO? At that time, the gap was headed by Mickey Drexler, one of the legendary mercantile CEOs of all time. So what did, he, what did Mickey say? He said, well, he really likes Banana Republic right now. He doesn't want to get this guy all upset. So he said, let's let it ride for a couple of years, and we'll come back to this. And you can see this conversation being repeated in big business after big business. Nobody wants to confront this issue. So what happens? Safe businesses subsidize risky businesses. You know who the worst culprits are? This? Banks like to dish out advice to other people. Banks, especially big money center banks, are the worst culprits when it comes to this process. Because for 20 years, what have banks done? They've got their risky business, like trading, hedge funds. And what are they funded by? Their old, boring, commercial banking business. And they use one hurdle rate across the bank. And they say, how come a banking business keeps getting smaller? This isn't the magic. That's exactly what will happen if you keep making it subsidize your riskiest businesses. So I want you to hold on to that idea because wherever you go to work, this is going to come up because this is fundamental in corporate finance that the risk of a project should determine its discount rate, not the risk of the entity taking the project. So by using bottom-up betas, not only do we get more precise betas, we get this unexpected bonus. Is if you give me GE, what can I give you back? the beta for each of its 26 businesses. You think that's not that useful. What's he trying to do right now with its 26 businesses? Has anybody been reading the news? It's been trying to sell them, right? Appliance business, the capital business, to sell the business. What do you have to do? You have to value the appliance business. To value the appliance business, what do you need? You need a cost of equity and a cost of capital for the appliance business, not GE as a company. This is fundamental to unraveling a big company as well. So. You might not like the way I estimated bottom-up betas, but come up with your own creative ways of using the law of large numbers to give you a better estimate, because it is fundamental to getting those betas by business. Any questions? So now let's do the bottom-up betas for the other companies, and then we'll kind of use this to kind of get around the process that private companies don't have historical data, at least on stocks, on returns. So I estimated bottom-up beta for Vale. 
Vale is a Brazilian mining company, but it's in four businesses, metals and mining, iron ore, fertilizers and logistics. I don't make up this stuff, I just go look it up on the annual report, so it doesn't require incredible creative thought on my part. So those are the five or four businesses. For the publicly traded companies that I use as comparables, those are my, my comparable companies. For metals and mining, I looked at global companies, so not just Brazilian companies, there weren't enough, in metals and mining with a market cap greater than a billion. You are saying, why put in a market cap greater than a billion? Well, I can add criteria because I have such a big sample. I have 48 companies that come through. The unlevered beta for those companies is 0.86. And my estimate of the value of metals and mining in Vale is about $17.7 .7 billion. So I'm doing exactly what I did for Disney at Vale, is estimating an unlevered beta and a value for the business. Iron ore. I looked at publicly traded companies in the iron ore business. There are 78. That's the advantage, again, of going global. You have a much bigger sample. Unlevered beta 0.83. The value that I estimate for the iron ore business for Vale is about 82 billion. You know, and that's about 76% of Vale as a company. It's mostly an iron ore company. Fertilizers, I went crazy. I had 693 companies in my sample. When you have 693 companies, you can do whatever you want. It gets the law of large numbers averages every kind of crappy thing you do. Okay. So the unlevered beta is 0.99. The value of the business is 5.74 billion. And finally, they're in a business that they call logistics. I have no idea what this is. Maybe it's they own the rail lines to move the iron ore from their mines. That's probably what it is. So I use the transportation business, 223 publicly traded companies, unlevered beta 0.75, value 1.87 billion. My estimated weights for the four businesses in the last column, my unlevered beta for Vale as a company, is 0.844. Exactly what I did for Disney, but broken down by Vale's four businesses. So just like I did for, for Disney, I came up with an unlevered beta. And here I use the same debt to equity ratio. You know why? These are all capital intensive businesses. I could have sat there and tried to divvy up the debt across the four businesses. It wouldn't have been worth the trouble. With Disney it was, because the movie business is very different from the theme park business. So reserve your energies for where it's going to pay off. You don't have enough time to be living, sitting there with little details and spending you know, six hours on something that's not going to matter. I come up with a levered beta for each of the four businesses. Why am I using the US dollar risk free rate? It's a Brazilian company. Remember, currency is a choice, right? Commodity companies report all their financials in US dollars. I could convert it all into nominal reais if I wanted to, but why go looking for trouble? I did everything in US dollars. Risk-free rate is 2.75%. And you might not remember, that's the equity risk premium for Vale. And what's its biggest market again? Does anybody remember? 37% from China. That's in that equity risk premium. There's my cost of equity for each of the businesses. Yes? I actually do the averaging and then do one. So the question was, there, when I get, get 20 companies, there are two ways I can get an unlevered beta for a business. I can get the unlevered beta for each company and then take the median of the unlevered betas. Nothing wrong with doing that. I'm too lazy. So here's what I do. I take the average beta, the average debt to equity in unlevel once, and my rationale is a very simple one. Each of these regression betas is pretty screwed up. I don't want to do any mathematical operation with any individual regression beta. By averaging first and then unlevering, I actually think I get a better estimate than unlevering each one and then averaging. But it's not a financial reason, it's a purely statistical reason. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Can you why, uh, the well, in this case, I didn't even try. Because with Disney, the, way, the reason they were different is I actually tried to allocate the debt to the five businesses based on what they said the assets were. Here, I didn't even try, partly because Vale reports very little at the divisional level, so that I'd, I'd be guessing, and partly because I looked at the four businesses, right? They're all big infrastructure businesses. Iron ore, you have to spend on mines. Logistics, you have to put rail lines in, you have to own. So every one of these businesses probably requires a huge amount of investment. So I said, I'm going to assume that they all have the same debt to equity, unless I have reason to believe otherwise. I would never do that with the GE. Obviously, GE capital requires a very different amount of debt than GE appliances and GE aircraft. I wouldn't do it for Disney. Theme park business, very different from the movie business. So look at your company. The more similar the businesses become in terms of capital intensity, the better off you are just using the same debt to equity ratio. Okay. Any other questions?
Any other questions? So I now have a cost of equity in US dollar terms. Let's play this forward. How many years to graduation? For most of you are two years, maybe three, maybe five. No, I'm five days, take that out of the picture. Maybe two to three years you're going to be out there, right? So let's suppose that, why are you guys looking so shocked? You plan to get out of here, right? right? <laughs> let's say whatever day you get out of here, you get a job. That's a good assumption to make at this stage in the process. And let's say this is a company like Vale, and you do everything in US dollar terms because it's a commodity company, a Petrobras or a Vale. And I'm your managing director, and I'm a complete jerk. I just want to make life really difficult for you. So I let you do all this work in dollars. And then when you show up in my office, I say, I really wanted you to do everything in nominal reais. What should you do? Quit and get out of there, but you, you're too caught. You, you have you know, loans you've taken, bought that new car, moved into the old, new apartment, you're, you're sunk. So you have to do everything now in nominal reais. There's a long way you can do it, right? You can go in and get the risk-free rate, nominal reais, and do it all not from the beginning, but that's so much work. I'm going to give you a shortcut that will let you go from a dollar number to a rei number or a peso number, a rupee number, or any other currency. It's a neat little trick. It works every single time. Here's what you need to do. Take the dollar cost of equity. In the case of, uh, of Vale, that's 11.23%. So that's uh, the 11.23% you see there? There's my dollar cost of equity. What did I say was the only reason rates are different in different currencies? Expected inflation. So I'm going to give you two pieces of information. Let's assume the inflation rate in nominal reais is 9% and the inflation rate in US dollars is 2%. So you can look up last year's inflation if you want, get an expectation. You're home free. If you're, re if you're really in a hurry, here's all you need to do. What's 9 minus 2? Come on, come on. 7%, take the 7%, add it to the 11.23%, you're pretty much done. 18.23% is now a nominal REI cost of equity. But that's going to take too little time. He's going to think you're cheating. So it look to make him, you know, I'm the managing director, you've got to act like you're doing something sophisticated. So here's what you can do. Take one plus, so you're going to see it makes very little difference at the end, but you know, it's, it looks like you're doing something incredibly complex. Take one plus a dollar cost of equity, multiply, it's a compounding effect. Inflation is a compounding effect. So instead of just adding the 7%, you multiply by 1.09, divide by 1.02. You end up with roughly the 18.23%. It will be a little higher because of the compounding effect. That's a nominal REI cost of equity. Of course, the other thing you could have done is to gone to a nominal REI risk-free rate and done what we did, you'd get very close to the same answer. So what I'm saying is if you get a cost of equity or cost of capital in one currency, you can convert to any other currency as long as you can get the inflation rate in that currency and the inflation rate in US dollars. Yes? This is expected. Now, oh, so this is not, so if you want to decide to use past inflation, do it with open eyes. I want an expected inflation rate. In the US, it's easy to get. It's very easy to get an expected inflation. All you have to do is open up the Wall Street Journal every morning. You get the expected inflation number. By doing what? Remember we talked about the tips rate? That inflation protected treasury bond? It's now about 0.75%. The 10-year T bond rate is about 1.75%. You know what that difference is? That's expected inflation. You compare the T bond rate to the tips rate, you got to expect it. So expected inflation for the U.S. is easy. Expected inflation for Brazil, you're going to have to stretch. Look at last year's inflation, make your best judgment, look at forecasts. World Bank actually forecasts inflation for the next five years. I can give you lots of sources to go look it up, but whatever that number is will now go into the numerator. And you got your, any currency you want. It's an, as I said, it's a neat trick because we live in a world where people change their minds about currencies all the time. So you're talking in rupees and all of a sudden they want to talk in dollars. You have to be able to make that mid-course correction and all you need to do is take inflation out of the picture or take that difference in inflation and you can move from currency to currency. Any questions about Vale's cost of equity? So let me do Tata Motors and Baidu. These were 
my life got a little simpler because these, both these companies, in my view, are single business companies. Tata Motors is in the automobile business. Baidu is in the search engine online advertising business. For Tata Motors, I looked up 76 publicly traded automobile companies, gained globally. You're saying, why don't you just look at Indian automobile companies? I get a sample of two. Doesn't help me. So I looked global. The average beta for those companies was 0 0.8601. And I used the debt to equity ratio for Tata Motors and the tax rate for India, 32.45%. The levered beta that I get for Tata Motors is 1.10. In rupee terms, the cost of equity is 14.49%. Yep. That is the company's debt to equity ratio. It's only in single business, so I don't have to allocate the debt. There's nothing to allocate it to, right? So allocation applies only if you have multiple businesses. And for Baidu, I use the, the beta of global companies that derive most of their value from online advertising. So this includes the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. The unlevered beta is 1.30. I use the tax rate for China, 25%, and the debt to equity ratio for Baidu, which is very small, 5.23%. I've got a levered beta for Baidu, 1.356. Yes? Same way I did for the studio business, right? What did I do? I took the levered betas. I took out the debt to equity. Remember how I did it for the studio? Go back and look at the studio business. It's actually, actually the template. Anytime you see me give you an unlevered beta for a business, I went and looked up 76 levered betas. Then I got the debt to equity ratios. I cleaned up for the debt, corrected for cash, came up with an unlevered beta. Because they have different debt to equity ratios, right? Your company's debt to equity ratio can be very different from the industry average. So let's say the typical automobile company is 80% debt and you have only 30% debt. I can't just use the levered beta for the automobile business because I have far less debt. So that's the whole reason you unlever and relever is because you're correcting for the fact that every company doesn't have the same debt to equity ratio as the industry average. And I have a cost of equity in, in, in Chinese remember here of 12.91%. So you can see it's the same process being played out. Disney and Bali and Tata Motors and Baidu. What's, what are the two companies I haven't done yet? One is a bookstore. I'll come to that because that's a tougher case. The other is Deutsche Bank. So I started in Deutsche Bank. And I said it was in two businesses. One is, of course, a banking business. The other is the investment banking business. For the banking business, I use publicly traded, diversified European banks, so big European banks. For the investment banking business, I had to go to the UK and the US. Why is that? Why didn't I look for European investment banks? In Europe, you know what happens to most investment banks? They're parts of regular banks, so Deutsche is, Deutsche is, so in, in, within Europe, you have very few standalone investment banks. They're all parts of regular banks. The Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanleys, I mean, those are unusual. They're, I mean, in Europe, you don't have similar companies. So I went with global investment banks, many of which are US, UK, and Asia has some investment banks. The, uh, I got the levered beta for those two groups. And I took a weighted average of the levered betas. Let's skip a step. It's actually a step that I was asked about just now. Wh what's the step that I skipped for Deutsche that I did for Tata Motors and Baidu? I didn't unlever and relever. Why do you think I avoided that step here? To unlever and relever, what do I need? I need a debt to equity ratio. Have you ever tried to figure out the debt to equity ratio for a bank? Try if you, if you want to torture yourself. Sit down with the bank's financial statements and ask, how much debt? does this bank owe? I will guarantee you that at the end of a week you will not know any more than when you started off. Why? Because debt to a bank is not a source of capital, it's raw material. You know what I mean by raw material? You borrow money at 4%, you lend it at 6 You make money off the spread. So to me, computing the debt to equity ratio for a financial service company is close to impossible. So I throw up my hands and I say, I'm going to use the beta for banks as the beta for the banking business, and the beta for investment banks as the beta for the investment banking business. So it's actually easy if you're doing a bank. You don't have to unlever and relever. And that beta is what I use to come up with the cost of equity in euro terms because I'm doing everything in euros. The risk-free rate is a euro risk-free rate. I'm a cost of equity for the banking business and the investment banking business. Guess what? It's much riskier to be in the investment banking business than in the banking business. So I should be demanding a much higher hurdle rate. 
And if you want to break that out into proprietary trading and you know, all the different parts of a bank, my guess is you're going to see layers of risk in a bank that give them all different hurdle rates. So I've kind of left the last company. So let's turn to Bookscape. I'm going to give you some history on how this, this company ended up as one of my six companies. About 15 years ago, sitting in my office, um, this lady comes in my office and she says, um, I've been told I should, I, she says, and she starts off the conversation by saying, I have a fight or flee decision. I said, what? What are you doing in my office? Fight or flee this, you know, maybe you should be going to the police. You know. She said, I own a bookstore in New York City. And she named the bookstore. And I said, oh, yeah, I love that bookstore. I come in there all the time. She said, I'm facing a fight or flee decision related to the bookstore. And I'm saying, what's going on here? She said, there's a new Barnes & Noble opening a block away from me. Okay? Turns out that her grandfather had opened this bookstore 60 years ago. He got this great lease. He opened the bookstore. Kind of ran itself for 60 years. She was now the owner, the sole owner of the bookstore. And she was running the bookstore. It was doing reasonably well. She had a great lease. But a new Barnes & Noble was opening a block away. I said, I still don't get what you want from me. She said, I have to decide whether to take the rest of my savings and put it into this bookstore to do what? To open a cappuccino bar and, and all the things that you get at a Barnes & Noble which weren't at the... So basically, the new couches, you know, places where people can sit. I still said, I still don't get it. So you're going to put the rest of your money in this bookstore. What do you need from me? Basically, what she needed from me was a measure of how much she should be demanding as a rate of return for putting the rest of us in. She wanted a hurdle rate. At which point you think, how the heck have you run your business for 60 years without a hurdle rate? The answer is, the business got started, it kept running itself. Lots of private businesses, you never run into this big investment decision because it kind of runs itself. So I said, okay. And she gave me a $100 gift certificate to the bookstore. It's okay, it's, and I love books. You know. So I got to work. I need a beta for a bookstore, right? So I went into, I think it was a Bloomberg terminal you know, next to my office, and I typed in book retailers, and I got three. Uh, actually, two. I'll show you what the book retailers look like. One was Barnes & Noble, and the other was Books A Million. Two. That's not a big enough sample, right? So I did my first ploy, which is to move up and down the food chain. The food chain in the publishing business, or the book business, is publishers. So I went looking for publicly traded publishing companies. My sample got up to 11, and I said, she gave me only a $100 gift certificate. This is good enough. Maybe a $100,000 gift certificate, I'll go for a bigger sample. 111 is good enough. You know, it's 11 is not bad, actually. You know, it's better than one. So I have the 11 publicly traded companies. I got the 11 betas for each of them. So just like I did for Disney, I've looked up the regression betas. The average beta, or let's stay with the median. The median beta across these companies is about 0.81. The median debt to equity ratio is about 21.41% and corrected for cash, the unlevered beta that I get for being in the book business is 0.76. Up till now, I've done exactly what I did for Disney, right? I looked at the business she was in. I looked at publicly traded companies. I've come up with an unlevered beta for being in the book business. In the case of Disney, after I got the unlevered beta for being in the business, what did I do? I levered that beta up using a market debt to equity ratio, right? Do you see the problem I'm going to run into? This is a private bookstore. There's no market debt. There's no market equity. I tried for the easy route first. I called the lady and I said, do you have a target debt to equity ratio? She, she said, a what? I hung up the phone because that kind of answered the question. Because if she said my target debt to equity ratio is 25%, I'd have plugged it in and moved on. I've never had a private business person ever give me an answer that solved this problem for me. So I have an unlevered beta. I don't have a debt to equity. So what's, here's what I assume. I looked at the debt to equity for other bookstores. So here I'm doing what I probably could have saved myself a step. I said, hey, you know what? You're in the book business. Your debt to equity is probably going to look like other companies in this space. I'm going to give you a 21.41% debt to equity. And I came up with a levered beta of 0.86. I plugged that in. I came up with a cost of equity of 7.5%. I'm home free, right? I almost called her. 
and gave her this as a hurdle rate when I remembered one thing about betas. What kind of risk do I capture in my beta? Risk that you, market risk is risk that you cannot diversify away. And why am I so cavalier about the rest of the risk? Because I assume the marginal investor is diversified and can get rid of that risk. Okay, when I talk about a Disney or a Vale, but in this case, who's the marginal investor in Bookscape? And what were the exact words you used? I'm going to take the rest of my savings and put it into this bookstore. She was actually explicitly telling me, I'm not a diversified investor. I'm going to have my entire wealth tied up in this business. So let's pause there. This is my cost of equity for a public book business. This lady has her entire wealth in this business. So she's exposed not just to the market risk, which is what the beta captures, but to the rest of the risk. See, ready? Here's my question to you. Would you underestimate or overestimate the cost of equity for this particular bookstore by using that 7.5%? I'm going to underestimate it. Why? Because I'm not capturing the rest of the risk, right? Which is she's exposed to. If I can somehow bring the rest of that risk into the picture, I'll have a more realistic cost of equity. I'll tell you the, the genesis for how I thought through this process. About 25 years ago, I was making a presentation to a group of appraisers. They mostly value private businesses. So I got to this point and I said, I've never understood what you guys do at this stage because everything in risk and return models and finance are directed towards public companies with diversified investors. How do you decide how much more than 7.5% you should have as a hurdle rate for a private business? You know what their answer was? We just add 10%. So it would be 17. I said, why 10%? You know what the answer to that was? It was here when I got here. In other words, there was no good reason. They were just adding 10% because they knew the cost of equity. The intuition was right, but they were making up a number, and that didn't work for me. So I came up with my own variant of this approach. Let me ask you a question. What am I not capturing in this cost of equity? The risk that you can diversify away, right? Is there something in those regressions that I use? In fact, I think I've given... Look at what's in the last column there. What have I collected for each of these companies in addition to their betas? I've collected the R squared. What do R squares measure? The proportion of the risk in each of these companies, that is, market risk. The average R squared, the median R squared across these companies is about 26%. What does that tell me? 26% of the variance in these companies comes from the market, 74% comes from the firm. The beta captures only that 26%. If I can somehow bring in the remaining 74% into my beta and into my cost of equity, I'll have a more complete cost of equity. So here's the final step in that logical... I took the market beta that I have. for those So basically that's the 0.8558 that you saw. I divided by the square root of 0.26. I'll tell you why I do this. It actually took me a while to figure out why I needed to do this. When I use R squares, I'm saying 26% of the variance in a stock comes from the market. Betas are standard deviation measures, which means everything is done in standard deviation terms. So rather than use the 0.26, I'm going to use the square root of the 0.26, which is square root of R squared, of course, is the correlation coefficient. 0.51, that becomes my scale. Think of an algebra problem. If I'm fully diversified, I see only the market risk, I demand a beta of 0.86. So if I'm fully diversified, I look at only the 51% of the risk, that's market risk, I charge a 0.8558 beta. If I'm not diversified like this lady is, the remaining 49% also comes into my beta, I call this a total beta. It's about twice as high as my regular beta because it captures total risk. I have a much higher beta. That much higher beta gives me a much higher hurdle rate, 11.98%. That's the number I called her and gave her. I said, your hurdle rate is about 12%. Then she asked me two questions. The first question was easy to answer. The second I knew the answer to, but I could not think of a kind way to give that answer. So here's the first question she asked. So I tell her, your hurdle rate is 12%. She kind of got it. I didn't have to go through betas and market risk. She kind of, 12% sounded reasonable to her. She said, what's Barnes & Noble's cost of equity? So 
publicly traded book chain. So what's that cost of equity going to look like? It's going to be closer to the 7.5%, right? Because they're publicly traded, their investors can diversify away risk. So I said that cost of equity is about 7.5%. You see what the second question is going to be? She said, if my cost of equity is 12% and their cost of equity is 7.5%, how the heck am I going to compete with these guys over time? You see why it's so much more difficult? Because you need to make 12%. So when you make investments, you need to make a much higher return. Barnes & Noble can look at that same investment and jump in. What's your honest answer to that question? You cannot. This is like climbing. It's not just capitalism. It's just that if you're an entrepreneur, you're inefficient about the way you bear risk. You're climbing a mountain to get to the same spot that the other guy got right off. The it's not fair, you're saying. But it's the nature of owning your own business. It's not an efficient way to take risk. I'm not saying you shouldn't own your own business, but walk in with open eyes. You know, when I moved to the city in 1986, there were probably 50 independent bookstores in New York City. All over the place. Today you walk around the city, you seven left, six. Shakespeare, I think, is closed on Broadway now. And I'll make a prediction. At the end of this process, you'll be lucky to have more than two or three stores left. And it's not the only business where this has happened. 30 years ago, if you walked into a pharmacy in the U.S., the owner of the pharmacy was probably behind the counter in 80% of all the pharmacies in the U.S. Pharmacies in the U.S. were primarily owned by individuals, and the pharmacists usually owned the pharmacy. Today, you walk into a pharmacy in the U.S., you look up, what do you see? You see CVS or Dwayne Reed, chains have taken over public. In business after business, publicly traded companies will drive out private businesses, not because private business owners don't work hard. They actually work harder than the public company managers, but they just have too much of a hill to climb because of the way they take risk. Okay. Any questions? Now, earlier on, I told some of you when you looked at your investor base that some of you might decide that your investor base... You know, remember we tested to see whether the marginal investor in your company was a diversified investor. And for my five companies, I concluded that I was okay. I said for some of you that might not be the case. If you've picked a smaller company, we've looked at the top 17 investors and you've decided that your marginal investor is not diversified, you see where you need to go. You might not go all the way to a total beta, but you'll have a market beta and a total beta, and you'll have to decide where in that space you're going to put yourself, saying, you know what, I'm not quite fully diversified. At least investors are not fully diversified. I'm going to end up with a cost of equity closer to the total beta than the market beta. That, of course, is going to push up your cost of equity and the cost of capital. Unfortunate, but it's reality. If you, have no, if you don't have diversified investors, that's going to be the effect it has on your hurdle rate. Any questions on private company cost of equity? So why do people run private businesses? If this is this much of a pain, what's the incentive for running private businesses? Yes. Higher what? Higher payoff at the end, only if you can flip the company public. So if you're doing a tech app company, is that your, your app that you were just describing? Or was, was that five? Oh, but let's say, let's say you were able to take that app over, do a hostile acquisition of the app or something. <laughs> there you can argue that the reason you're okay as a private entrepreneur is you're not looking to stay private for very long. What do you hope to do? You either hope to go public or sell it to a public company so you hope to make the payoff. Let's cut that off. I mean, my neighbors in, uh, in the town that I used to live in used to own the five and dime store in town. You ever been in a five and dime store? It's basically everything on the face of the earth is in the store. It's like... The old Woolworths used to be like this. You walked in, you'd have everything except groceries. You could buy little of this, little of that. There's no exit for them. There's no value exit. So if you take that out of the picture, people still own private businesses, right? So what are the explanations? Yeah. Okay. How much is control worth? What are you controlling? Yourself, right? I mean, it's, it's, this isn't a gigantic corporation where you can say, I'm sending people off. You know, there's not that much to control other than you and your, perhaps your own family. You're never going to go public. Let's take that out of the picture. You want, can't go public. You know you're making less than if you took the money you've invested in this business and put it in a mutual fund. That's pretty much what I'm saying. But you keep doing it. 
or em I call these emotional dividends. There's nothing wrong with it, right? I mean, there is this, this thing about running your own business and building it. And there's nothing wrong with running a business for emotional dividends as long as you're honest about the reason that you're doing it. Because if you bitch and moan about how you make a lower return than you could have made, just stop. Just sell the damn business. Put in a mutual fund. Let's get it over with. So if you're going to run this business, do it because you truly enjoy being your own boss. Truly enjoy building a business. Yeah? So that's one. That could be, you could say, look, if I become a public company, I have disclosure requirements. And in fact, you could argue that this can actually affect even a company which is worth $60 billion, like Uber is. Maybe why go public if you can stay private and get all the privileges of being a public company without ever going public? But for really small businesses, you're going to get regulated no matter what, right? You still have you know, all those things. Right? You don't have lawyers to do it for you. I mean, running a private business is not a picnic. I know entrepreneurship is really hot right now, but you have to recognize that, especially in businesses where there isn't that escape hatch of being able to sell your business, flip it, you know, that exit, you're doing it not just for money anymore. You're doing it for the emotional dividends. Or you are a niche business. You know, a niche business is a small enough business that a public company will never be able to enter that space. There's a bookstore, I don't know where it is, 23rd, 24th Street, called the Mystery Bookstore. Okay? And all that, it's a small bookstore, and all it sells are only mystery books. And I swear, the person who runs the bookstore, the owner, who sits behind the counter, has read every single book in the bookstore. So you walk up to her and say, you know what, I like Sue Grafton. She says, have you tried these three authors, you know, Kathy Wright, you know, so and so. Because they're, 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 you try to go to Barnes and Noble, and I like Sue Grafton to the cashier. What does the cashier say? Who the heck is Sue Grafton? Why are you telling me, right? Just pay for the damn book, get out of here. Okay, so the reality is that there will be niche businesses where private companies will continue to operate, especially personal service businesses. So they're not going to completely disappear, but they will get smaller and smaller as an economy gets bigger. And this is starting to happen in Asia and Latin America, and it's making people nostalgic. Right? Because Asia and Latin America, historically, the, and much of Europe too, most businesses were privately run. The mom and pop operation, the owner was behind the counter. There's something that, that we like about that, but it's still an inefficient way of investing your money. And you've got to be able to get over that. Yes, sir. Well, you also get to keep all your losses. Right? So in a sense, you, you're the sole equity investor. You get to keep all the profits. You get to keep... So what? That's not true. Let's say you sell half your business. You keep half the profits, right? Okay, what happened to the money that you got when you sold half the business? You didn't go into a trash can or under the ground. You invested it elsewhere. You're going to get profits anyway. In fact, what am I saying right now? The profits you make from a private business will be less than the profits you'd make if you sold the private business and invested it in a mutual fund. So you're going to make profits, but you're making less profits than you could have as a public investor because you've chosen not to diversify. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a tough, tough, tough question to answer. Why do private businesses continue to exist? But they will. I think they will stay on, but there will be a smaller and smaller segment of each economy. So when you get a chance, I'd like you to do this for your company. I know right now you have the quiz on Wednesday. On Wednesday evening, I'm actually going to send you a case. You might not know this case is coming, but it's been on your Google Calendar. The case is not due till March 30th. So why am I sending it to you right now? Because I know, I know in my heart that you will not look at it till March 28th. Okay? <laughs> I want you to read it at least. So please, this is all I want from you. I want you to read the damn case before you go on spring break. Don't work on it, just read it. Let it fester. Anybody, don't leave yet. I have like six minutes. I'm not going to let you out in six minutes early. Okay? So, but I want you to think about that and I'll tell you what the quiz is going to look like. Oh, actually, why should I? Have you seen the past quizzes? Do they all look the same? What's the first question? It's always a multiple choice question mostly. Okay? Half a point each. Same pattern. What's the second question? It's either on a regression or it's got something to do with risk-free rates and equity risk premiums. The third question is what separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls, the people who know it from the people who don't know it. And that's a question where I ask you to 
work with levered and unlevered betas, different business betas. It is the question that you will have the most trouble with because it forces you to think. The rest you can just replicate mechanics and get away with. The third question, I'll always find a way to throw in a twist you might not have seen before and you'll have to be able to deal with it. It won't be a difficult twist. It just means you can't copy from a previous quiz. It looks just like that. It looks just like that quiz except for a little twist. So if you just copy the answer down, it's not going to work. So do go through as many practice quizzes. And when I say go through, don't look at the problem, look at the solution. Look at the problem, look at the solution. That's not going through a past quiz. Because that will give you this false sense of, I get this, this is so easy. Oh, that's exactly what I've done, right? <laughs> it's not what you'd have done. So what I want you to do is actually take a quiz, try it, get stuck. You will get stuck and try to get unstuck on your own. It's really tempting to look at the solution, try to avoid looking at the solution and work it through. Because you will get stuck on the quiz and with 30 minutes, you've got to get unstuck. Because if you stay stuck, time's going to fly by. So I will see you on Wednesday. Your question? Can, the question was, can you use iPads? You can bring in iPads and use them with no, with no Wi-Fi. Okay? iPads, no Wi-Fi, no laptops.
since your... That comes from the historical premium. So an earlier... But that's for it was, wasn't given in the promise. So that's why I said earlier quizzes, you'll see 8.5 and 5.5 show up because they're coming from the historical premiums that people were using for right. that quiz. So but, but in on the quiz, most of them will be given. Either that or you look it up in your notes. It's open book, open notes. Okay. So for the U.S. right now, that's... Well, look up the table. There is a historical premium table, right? Okay. So stocks minus T bills, I think 7.92 percent maybe. Okay. Yeah. Also, are you going to go over this quiz? Uh, this is the um, review quiz one PowerPoint. Yeah, that's what I'll do in tomorrow's session. Tomorrow's session. So are you still having the TA session as well? I think you're going to have office hours instead. They're going to be there, so if people have questions, you can go in during that hour. So they'll be in that room during the hour. But you oh, no, not that room. No, no, they, they're going to get later hours, four to five, I think. So I'll send that out today. So they've kind of moved it later in the day for an hour. So if you have questions that come up, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of different questions. Um, I'm not sure what my. I think we just went over this thing. So basically, you'd have to take that to beta for the company. Right. And you'd have to then divide by 0.9 for both to come up with an unleavened beta for the business. Because one minus the cash value. So it's 90% of the cash value. Your question? Yeah. What's the question? Uh, logic. What's the logic question? Uh, what about it? No, tell me what's what's the logical problem? I really have a so leverage beta is the I understand it's like a market. Equity. You know, leverage beta is a beta for your equity. Unlevered beta is a beta of your business. That's it. Yeah, exactly. The business and the cash, what's the relationship between them? You asked me about levered and unlevered beta or the unlevered beta and cash? They're two separate issues. Uh, unlevered beta is a beta of your business. Mm -hmm. Levered beta is a beta of your equity. You can have a safe business with risky equity if you borrow enough money. Right. That's right. the relation between levered and unlevered beta. The unlevered beta for a company is a, is a weighted average of different assets, one of which happens to be cash. The unlevered beta of cash is zero. So if you're in two businesses, one is cash and the other is a risky business, the unlevered beta for the company would be a weighted average. So levered unle that has nothing to do with levered and unlevered beta. You're on the asset side of the balance sheet. So think of it as a financial balance sheet. Mm -hmm. On the asset mm -hmm. side of the balance sheet, you have all these assets. You have the unlevered beta for all the assets. Okay. The unlevered beta for the company is a weighted average of the unlevered beta for all the assets. Mm -hmm. Now you have an unlevered beta for the company. Mm -hmm. Then I ask you, what's the beta for your equity? That's when you've got to bring in how much you borrow. And if you borrow a lot of money, you can take a safe business and make it risky. So the minute you say levered beta, it's got to do only with the equity side of the balance sheet. Unlevered beta has to do with what do you own, how risky are they, weighted average. Okay? So take what we did today, because that's very much what we were doing. With Disney, we broke it down to five businesses. We got the unlevered betas for all of them. And then we said, how much have you borrowed? Because that affects my equity beta. The levered beta captures how risky equity is in the company. 